So I guess good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Welcome to the session. My name is Rei Hua Dong. I'm with the World Bank Group Language and Culture Program. We do offer actually a curriculum of three uh, three different workshops. One is uh, working across cultures, communicating across cultures, which is what we are going to do today, and also managing intercultural complexities. So welcome again. And uh, this is going to be a very interactive session, and I hope we are going to love it. So communicating across cultures, and I'm sure you know this is what has brought you to us today. And with the, the international kind of working environment, diversities, and also the complexities of our business with the stakeholders, business partners, and clients, communication is always one of the biggest challenges. To get us started, I would like to invite you to share, actually to type one, two, three, four, which really resonates most with you. So we'll give you a minute. Take a look at the sayings and the typing, which one really resonates most with you. All right, great. Let's see, we have eight, nine, 12. Okay, great. So I guess all of us have entered your preference, the one that resonates most with you. Let's take a look at the results here. So for number one, which is, we have two years and one mouth, and 42% uh, of us actually kind of voted for this one. And for number two, which is everything becomes a little different as soon as it is spoken out loud, it has got 7.14%. And then we have 28 for the third by Plato, and also 21 for the last one. What does this show us? It's really interesting when you look at this. So this is I guess when you vote, maybe, you know, either it is more natural of you when you prefer to listen in lots of situations during communication, or you believe that listening is a part of what we need to do more. Actually, from the face-to-face -face workshops, very often one of the biggest barriers actually for communication listed is listening. This really kind of, you know, in a way, shows us what is what we need to work more on. So given the complexities, and here are the objectives. So very different, actually, communication styles, right? So I want to give more, en more energy on listening, or I want to speak up more, or I really want to pay attention to my tones, to my, you know, the way how I present what I want to say. So the objectives will be actually you know, through the next uh, 90 minutes. Uh, at the end of the day, we should be able to describe actually your communication styles and also your comfort zone and uh, also what are the styles and the comfort zones of our colleagues, business partners, and the clients. And what will be the potential challenges 
for example, if some of us really believes in listening, while some of us believe in clear message and uh, uh, speaking up. So, what would be the potential challenges there if we were working together? And then you know there will be a model, actually Blink model. Don't worry yet what Blink is. We'll be talking about it. So how the model can help us to communicate better, to be more effective. And of course, we'll try to have fun too. OK, I would like to invite you to take a look at this case study here. And we know communication can enhance our business at the same time, can damage a relationship if the differences are not handled uh, appropriately. So take a look at this, and I do have a question for you after your reading. So communication is critical for our life with a relationship, for a business team, and uh, also, of course, you know, for the international affairs and diplomatic relationships. So this case study is about Sato's visit, actually, to Washington in 1969, and the President Nixon insisted that Japan actually exercised export restraint. And Mr. Sato from Japan with the Japanese background, of course. And uh, he replied, Zensho Shimatsu. If we have uh, colleagues from Japan, excuse me for my pronunciation. <laughs> Hopefully I get it. So, which really means I will do my best. And also, with this message, he did deliver a heavenward glance, if we did pay attention, the body language part. So Nixon believed he did get Mr. Sato's agreement when there was actually no practical follow-up. So we can imagine how Nixon felt there, right? So here's the question I would like you to really type your answers to. What was the gap between Mr. Sato's answer and how did Nixon actually understand it? Yeah, take a minute and please type your answer then. Okay, great. Some of us said it's direct, indirect communication. Yeah, we have lots of messages, answers coming in. We'll give it another sec, and then we'll close the poll.
I believe some of us are taking the last sec to type in the answers. Okay, let's uh, end the poll here and see what we have. Okay, excellent. All right, Nixon should have follow up. Sato's response right away at that moment to clarify, right? Different interpretation of a formula, interpretation, and he said he will try. So Nixon assumed he was agreeing, direct versus indirect communication. Excellent. So Sato, I will close what I supposed to be the best solution. Nixon, you will do what I want you to do. Difference between direct and also the courteous culture, yes, intent versus action and also impact, right? Nixon thought I would do my best means Mr. Sato agrees to his request. I know enough about the culture of Japan. To, I don't know enough. Yeah, Nixon thought. So, yes, excellent. Thank you very, very much. This really captures what uh, was the major gap. When Sato said, I'll do my best, especially with the Japanese kind of classic body language, heavenward uh, eyebrow moment, kind of, you know, moving up the eyebrow, which is really actually a way to say no. So there were lots of cultures that don't really say no clearly. And uh, sometimes yes could be indirect as well. So while in some cultures, like Nixon, really expecting a direct answer, so believing when Sato said, I'll try my best, means yes. So for many of us, I guess, you know, we have been there in our conversations with our colleagues, with our business partners. So could be chances that, you know, we believe we understood the message or, you know, uh, what our business partners have said, but at this time, uh, sorry, at the same time, it's really our own understanding. So what I'm going to share here, thanks for the Paul. So let's go back to the presentation. All right, so what was the gap? The gap, of course, was direct versus indirect communication intent of actually, you know, Sato, who was trying to be polite, not to say no, not to cause Nixon to lose the face, while Nixon believed he said yes. All right, so the next we're going to look at a communication star map to see how people really react on different dimensions uh, in communication. I did have a question actually about uh, Geert Hofstadt's cultural dimensions. And those cultural dimensions are values. By the way, I'll be integrating your questions actually that I have got already uh, throughout our discussion. And also at the end of uh, our presentation, so we will try to spend some time for a quick Q&A. Of course, our communication doesn't stop just at the end of today. So we can continue through our email, through you know different ways uh, to connect. So here I'm the communication style, so direct versus indirect, which many of you have already actually pointed out. So the scale is one to seven. So with the verbal, with the text we use, for direct style, so it's really the word level. I mean what I say, I say what I mean. But with lots of cultures, like in Japan and lots of East Asian countries, and some Latin countries as well. So especially when it comes to say no, comes to disagreement, we don't feel comfortable to challenge. And then what we do is really kind of, you know, indicate our no rather than no out there to hurt the listeners. 
So with the language actually, you know, explicit, clearly spell out when we are more direct in the direct culture of communication. So take the word level and I will be very explicit, make it very clear what I really mean. So ambiguity actually is really part of uh, being an indirect, the way of speaking vaguely. So not to give a clear message. And uh, actually though, yesterday I submitted uh, my uh, OPE for our friends not working for the World Bank. It means overall performance evaluation. And then, you know, my managers send a reply back saying, you know, here are our comments. Do you agree? I replied, I said, uh, you know, it has been a great year. I really enjoyed it. I look forward to working with you more. So what has missed is really the clear answer to, yes, I do agree. So the manager had to come back and say, Rehua, is that really a Chinese way of saying yes? So that ambiguity, but for some cultures, you know, the clear answer is indicated rather than the clear word itself. And then confrontation, especially with confrontation. So face-to-face -face confrontation, it's a big no-no-no for lots of cultures, especially in this case with the Sato and the Nixon. For Nixon, I'm sure he was expecting a direct answer. As long as he doesn't hear no, that means a yes. But, you know, uh, Sato was trying to avoid, actually, you know, uh, the confrontation. So, of course, there was email is listed, listed here as an alternative way, maybe, of saying no or giving yourself a minute to really sleep on what you want to say or a disagreement so that you can phrase it in a way that your, uh, your recipient can take it. So with the Sato, of course, you know, face to face. And then, you know, with, uh, sorry, uh, with the Sato, it's a saving face. With Nixon, it's a face to face conversation. Say what you mean. And in our work, of course, when we don't feel comfortable to challenge, to confront, email could be an alternative. There was a question actually by one of our participants actually about how about information technology? How is it helping us? This is one way it helps us. Of course, it helps also with you know what we are doing today, right? Uh, instead of face-to-face -face communication workshops, we're doing this uh, through webinar. All those are the actually you know the benefits uh, the information technology brings to us. At the same time, many of you might have heard that communication actually is made up of three major parts. So the nonverbal, which is a body language, that accounts for 55% of communication, a very big percentage. And uh, 38 should be the tones we use in our communication, which actually kind of, you know, relates to the last picture, remember number four? It's what, not what you said, it's how you said it. And only 7% is actually, you know, the word, the text we use. So talking about advantages or disadvantages of uh, the information technology, so email, of course, is one way, important, actually, means of information technology. It helps us to connect at the same time disconnect because of the lack of humanity. We don't have the nonverbal languages. Of course, our text could actually show our tone sometimes, but still, only seven is the word. So that's what our email has captured, just to answer the question of one of our participants. And of course, you know, speaking and the persuasion, all those. I want to give you 30 seconds to take a look at the skills and just imagine where you would be. And going back to the case study with uh, Nixon and Sato, how would you have responded? You don't have to type in anything. Just close your eyes for 30 seconds and think what would be a challenge for you in that same context.
Okay. So imagine yourself standing on one. Let's move down the second column. We do have tolerance of silence. So cannot tolerate silence in communication. So if you have a one tolerance or zero tolerance, or maybe two, maybe three. And at the other end, it's really, you know, some of the culture, some of our colleagues, business partners might feel more comfortable when they, you know, before they speak, they take a pause. And, you know, for those who really cannot tolerate si uh, silence in communication in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, and you might feel the urge to jump in. So you might want to try to help out, right? Your colleagues who are really silent when you expect them to speak. But for actually, you know, colleagues, some cultures, standing at seven, they do need that pause. And also, very often, I guess, that interruption comes in, right? So we all have experience. And either before you speak, or actually in the middle of your speech or conversation, somebody will jump in, which could be actually, you know, a big kind of, you know, stress point. But at the same time, you know, they might, the colleagues, as you have said, you know, intent versus action. So the intent could be to show my enthusiasm. We are going to actually take one of the dimensions as example, confrontation. So how many of us do feel comfortable to show our confrontation, to show a different opinion and disagreement? Imagine we are in a team meeting, we are with a big crowd, and uh, most of the team would say yes, yes, yes. And you believe, you don't want to say yes because you know it's a no. So would you feel comfortable to say no? Or would you really rather avoid that no or maybe express it in a very indirect way. So position yourself, see if you are one, two, three, four, until seven. All right, everybody has uh, taken your vote. Okay, let's look at the percentage here. So from one, actually we do have one of our colleagues. And for number two, we do have four actually uh, friends here. And then the biggest percentage is number five in the middle. When you are standing in the middle, of course, it will be easier, right, for you to reach to both sides. But still, when you do have friends, when you do have a big party, for example, standing from one to two, which is their comfort zone, that means they will be very direct in what they want to say. And how would you feel? How would you really react? So psychologically, emotionally, you might feel defensive already, or you might feel pulling away from the group with one and the two. Uh, a quick example from the onboarding group, actually, you know, I do deliver this training across the bank, and uh, especially this is part of the core curriculum for our new onboarding staff. And the one colleague from France, and uh, actually, you know, he came for a managerial position. He said, one thing that really challenges at, uh, with me, with my team, is that, you know, I have to really sugarcoat any criticism or any disagreement. Talking about this, you know, sugarcoating, and uh, I know lots of us are, uh, do work with the World Bank. And again, you know, uh, this is the end of the year. Kind of evaluation time and then many of us are feedback providers and I ask this question all the time so how often do we really say what you want to say and how often do you really tell your colleague this is what you need to work on and the most 
in most of the cases, I guess it's excellent, great job. And we try to avoid what is not really making us feeling pleasant, I guess. So, and uh, even for managers, very often, you know, when you get the feedback, you will always hear, you know, great job, excellent, excellent. So how direct do we want to be? It kind of beats the purpose of actually, you know, the evaluation when we really want to learn what we need to work on. But all we hear back is something not even substantially kind of, you know, convincing enough sometimes about just excellent, excellent. Like 20% of us should be actually 80% of us should be in that exceptional or excellent uh, uh, bracket, right? Okay, so imagine you stand, as we have said, going back to this confrontation dimension, especially for lots of cultures, like from Satos and Japan, China, and Vietnam, uh, so East Asia. And then, most probably, you will feel comfortable here. And for you, it's going to be very hard to speak loud. Going back to Herman Hesse's number number two, I think, you know, in our picture, you know, speak up, speak loud. So are we really capable of doing that? It's nothing wrong with either you are at number seven or at number one. But the key actually you know, point for us is to be aware of where we are, where your friends are, where your business partners are, so that we can avoid that gap of understanding between Sato and Nixon. All right, let's move on. So, what is your actual top stress point in communication? For some friends, actually, you know, interruption can be a big stress while you're talking or before you talk, somebody else jumps in. For somebody, you know, listening, not listening, or even coming to ask a question, not to listen with an open heart could be a big, big, actually, you know, hot button. If that gets kind of, you know, pulled off and we just lose control of ourselves, we can run wild uh, there. And some of us could be just, you know, very sensitive with BMW. I don't know if you have heard of this acronym as if we need more acronyms here. BMW. This is not the car we drive. B stands for bitching. M is moaning. W is whining. So this could be, you know, uh, pretty common with some working environment but this could be a big kind of, you know, stress point for me. Now, we are going to open the power. Please type in, you know, what really gets you kind of nervous? What really gets you kind of, you know, on the defensive side in communication? What will be that behavior? I know many of us really are typing, and thank you.
great. Thank you for sharing all this. All right, we'll give it another sec for those who haven't finished submitted. You can click on submit your uh, comment here. All right. I think most of us have completed, in case you haven't got a chance, and our conversation, as we have said, will be open even until after our session today. So 11 colleagues of us, I mean friends of us, have uh, submitted your answer. So the very first one, so when someone is not addressing my question, answering a different topic, I'm sure we all have been there, right? Especially when people are so focused on their phones, so mindful, not mindful, but mindful of, you know, what is on their agenda. Very often, you know, we give very little attention to what we are expected to do and um, maybe answering questions not relevant at all. And uh, so the next one, I feel the interlocutor judges me. Yes. So we'll be talking about judgment even more, given, remember going back to the communication style map? If you stand at number seven, looking at somebody standing in a comfort zone of one to two, so our expectation of the behaviors or responses will be very similar to what we are familiar with, what we are comfortable with, when it is against actually our norms of behaviors and then our judgment comes in, right? And also, uh, in, different, in a different workshop, actually, we do talk about managing intercultural complexities, the emotional stages uh, for how we feel. Uh, for example, you know, some of us could be very reactive, kind of highly sensitive, and tend to polarize when somebody judges me, and that is a polarizing action. You know, it's us versus them, always negative. If anything happens my way or the highway, right? My way, the right way. So, yes, so this could be one of the hot buttons for many of us, bad face, awful. So I guess you by bad face, do we mean, you know, not really starting with the best, in, best giving the best side of for understanding the story. So also I can get impatient with the person who uses too many words. For somebody who are explicit with the words, with their expression, and in their style, of course, you know, for the other side who try to use the context more, who believe we all have the background information, and then they try to use fewer words, this can be a little kind of challenging. And confrontation, arrogance, selfishness, if someone gets defensive for no reason. Yes, as we discussed just now, someone, when someone, a brick wall is not open to listening suggestions. Very often when you talk with somebody, you know, the answer will be, oh, I'm listening, I'm listening. While they are focused on the phone or they are focused on their screen of the computer, or, you know, they might be looking at you, blinking, kind of, you know, at you, but internally, mentally, completely checked out. So this happens all the time. Okay, so direct attack. So obviously, you know, to be indirect, kind of to be more aware of the others, emotional, how do they feel? You know, talking about emotional, emotional intelligence is really to understand not us, but who work with you, who is around us, creating a positive environment for, you know, for the team, for the business kind of negotiations, so that we can really make our communication effective and build a long-term working relationship. So talking about this, actually one of us did send in a question about half debts. Uh, uh, so, yes, 
Dear Half Dads, Cultural Dimensions. And uh, for those of us who haven't heard of him, he is one of the biggest names in the intercultural studies. Geert Hofstadt actually did lots of research and studies about, you know, uh, the culture, cultural values, national culture profiles. And he did come up with, at first, four cultural dimensions, then added another one, and then added one more. So one key actually is the uh, power ranking distances. And also, you know, collectivism versus individualism. And uh, so a few more, if you're interested, I can send you the resource. So uh, all those are actually, you know, the value level. By value, actually, you know, it's really the anchors for our behaviors. For example, why am I direct? Why am I avoiding, you know, negative feedback? Why am I not telling you, uh, you know, what I don't like about you? I only say what I like about you. And especially some of us uh, tend to be very nervous talking about, you know, confrontation and all that. And uh, so especially with who, your who is your manager, right, the seniors. So when we, talk, when we look at culture, very often there are three different levels we do look at. Number one is the core values. Number two, actually, kind of in between, is our understanding of it. And then number three, the top level is really our behavioral level. It's how do we manifest, demo what we believe in. But what usually actually hit us first is the actual behavioral kind of side. And uh, with um, direct attack, we don't know. So it could be a direct attack, kind of, you know, ill intention. So we have to admit there are difficult people, difficult, difficult situations and conversations. However, could be, you know, from where we are, are we reading it really the way what is intended by, by the interlocutor? Okay, great. So we have different stress buttons, right? When those stress buttons, when those behaviors hit us, we tend to lose control. We tend to feel kind of, you know, defensive. We tend to actually pick up a fight. So is that really what is intended by the other side? So like with a subtle, in, most, in many cases, that's not the case. So with more cultural awareness, with more understanding of where we are, where our interlocutors are, where our business partners and teammates are, and that could help actually reduce our reaction in such situations. So what gives us really different kind of, you know, ways and reactions and the different styles to communication? First, of course, you know, is our basic human needs. Uh, am I? So I'm trying to click on. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> OK, sorry. All right, so all those are the different factors that do play a role in, you know, why we communicate that way, why Nixon was uh, expecting a direct reply from Sato, why Sato was trying to avoid, like, you know, the stress uh, points. So different stress points for, for us, you know, because we all come with actually our own cultural background. First, with basic human needs, we believe, you know, we all have the same uh, human needs, security, fairness, respect, autonomy, belonging. But even security, for example, and uh, in different contexts, in different geographical areas, different countries, it will be very different. For some, of, uh, for some of us, security will mean, actually, you know, to have enough pay for your huge mansions for your BMW and uh, to send your kids to a private school. And for some of us, security might be just if I have three meals for my kids, if my, I make sure my kids can go to school. And especially when we think of our clients, we're helping actually our 
uh, you know, helping getting rid of poverty, where kids cannot even go to school, where kids don't have enough uh, to stay warm and stay actually, you know, kind of uh, secure. So even the basic human needs can be so different, giving us different lenses. So of course, where we came from, our religious background, where we have been to school, our generation, even sexual orientation is a part of what uh, one of the important factors we kind of, you know, uh, put into consideration when we talk about cultural differences and different ways of doing things and different communication styles. And the personality, of course, is one very important factor. Sometimes even if I grew up with my twin sister or brother in exactly the same kind of environment, we could still be very different. One could be direct, one could be indirect, one could be more kind of, you know, uh, on the outspoken side, could be understood as even aggressive, and the other tend to be kind of, you know, mild or modest in their kind of comments. Okay. So we did talk about value lenses, right? So it's summer in Washington, D.C., and I don't know, maybe different seasons in different areas where you came from right now, but you know, that value lenses, because of our background, so we do look at the reality around us with our own interpretation. So very often, the reality is not what it is, is how we re read it, how we react and look at it. So given this, we did have an example of actually international diplomatic relationship. And we are going to look at this, which is closer to uh, you know, where we work. And while you watch it, please pay attention to what has gone wrong. A question about the proposal that Mohammed made in last week's meeting. What do you think about the safeguard standards that he proposed? Well, yeah, I um, did have a few comments about the standards. I wish you had told me earlier. What are your comments? Well, first of all, the um, standards opposed the one we had suggested in our meeting of last time. Of course, time I should have realized that earlier. Jerome, why don't you speak up during the meeting? Muhammad already made a presentation earlier today to management. Well, I didn't feel comfortable and... Muhammad it's about the quality of the project and our safeguard standards. Now we'll have to retract that proposal and present a newer version. Jerome, next time you see something like this, you need to speak up. No exceptions. Yeah, okay. I will try. Thanks. Did we all get it? We could hear clearly, did we? All right. Uh, did it look familiar to us all? Somewhere it has happened, right? So some of our participants might even know in those two colleagues of us. And uh, so this is one actually uh, videoed uh, skit based on actually one of the experiences or, you know, in communication kind of conflict shared by one of our participants. And uh, what went wrong? Anything that went wrong? Please type in how you felt, how, your reaction, what really went wrong if it was an effective communication there.
All right. Great. So we could end the poll right now and share what we have got here. I hope everybody can see it clearly. So she cut him off and didn't really let him explain himself. Her response to him was rude. They don't have the same way to work in team, especially how to express their questions doubt. And she continuously interrupted. He obviously does not feel comfortable speaking up. Very aggressive, very different styles. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. The woman did not encourage participation. She closed down the conversation with her body language. One person was not listening and was impatient, blaming, pointing finger. Why don't you, right? She demands him to speak up. And was she really encouraging him to speak up? Thank you very, very much. While you were actually putting your uh, responses here, I was looking at the chat side as well. And Allison, thank you very much, Allison Cave, and uh, who has got a couple of questions and comments. The first comment actually about direct and indirect communication style, uh, talking about the goal. So for the indirect, the communi communication style goal is not to beat around the bush. No. So for indirect side, you are absolutely right, uh, Alison. So indirect side, actually, the goal of communication is to build harmony, build trust first before any other kind of you know, communication takes place, before the word text message happens. Yes. So you are absolutely right. Preserve relationships, face harmony, and then which leads to trust. For direct side, actually, direct kind of challenge to understand the message. That's how they build the trust. And the other one about Geert Hofstadt's cultural dimensions. Yes, Alison, there is one dimension about gender, masculinity versus femininity. Yes, thank you. Coming back, actually, you know, to where we were, but we'll close the the poll here, going back to our yes slide. What went wrong? So we know, you know, the misunderstanding, the gap of communication, the different interpretation, direct versus the indirect, right? And uh, what is the end result? Is we are talking about diversity. We are talking about the building inclusion. Do you think the young, obviously the junior kind of gentleman, right? And uh, rather than encouraging him to speak up and kind of helping him to see what would be a more constructive way to speak up, you know, speak up. Why don't you speak up? Next time, no exceptions. And those can only make the young gentleman more defensive, as you have said, and maybe less competent, less less confident and then maybe less competent in speaking up, sharing openly. So, and that's really the lady, our, you know, uh, our lady friend know what was actually the impact on our colleague there. So, did she really mean to hurt him? Did she really mean to kind of, you know, disempower him? Uh, empower him? Uh, I wouldn't think so. Actually, you know, in reality, when we did get back to uh, check with a colleague uh, about, you know, the conversation, there was a big laugh at the same time, a big reflection. And uh, from the, uh, the TTL side, actually, she was completely unaware and all her intention was get the work done. And she was worried about, you know, the delivery and uh, retracting what we have submitted. And, uh, and we didn't have time or room for how our colleagues feel. But when we say when teams break down, when communication breaks down, and that's what happens when there is a gap, when we are not even aware of what we have done to our, uh, you know, conversation kind of dialogue partners. So 
what went wrong. We have a very clear picture, and thanks all for all your comments there. Take a look at this picture. How does he look? Charming smile. Anything looking awkward to you? All right, ready? Let's flip it around. Okay. So going back to you know the the our TTL and our young gentlemen, newer uh, uh, younger kind of junior staff, and uh, so when you look at the picture, so how can we apply that switching perspectives? So even if our uh, you know, TDL does have the best intention, actually. I'm sure speaking up can be a big kind of, you know, uh, big kind of uh, competence we need, especially working in the international business kind of context. It will help us. When the gentleman, for example, the junior staff, uh, if he did, or he was able to speak up, that would have saved the problem, the trouble of, you know, submitting something with a problem, and then we have to get it back. Uh, that, for sure, is the best intention, actually, from our TTL to the young man. However, from where our junior staff comes in, you know, and uh, he didn't have that comfort level yet, that takes time to build. And also by, you know, doing, even if we have the best intention, uh, my perspective is this is the most important. But when we flip it around from where our junior staff sees looking at the conversation, it's completely kind of damaging. Should I speak up again next time? All he said is, I'll try. Maybe just like subtle, he wouldn't be able even to try to speak up anymore. Okay, so switching perspective actually is one of the key when we talk about understanding cultural complexities, especially with our communication, all those different kind of dimensions we talk about, and Sato and Nixon. If Nixon had been able to switch perspective, seeing where Sato came from, there wouldn't have been that ugly picture of calling him a liar. Okay, so what would be your tip? given such a situation to solve the communication challenges. And also maybe thinking back of actually the hot button stress point for you in communication. So what could be actually, you know, one of your uh, tips or advice to us all to solve such challenges? Please use the power and type in your response here. We have nine comments in right now. Ten. We have two more seconds.
Great. One more second, we'll close the poll. Okay, I'm sure some of, uh, some of us are still writing uh, due to time. I have to close it right now so that we can share all together. Okay, so here comes the tips of advice for us all. Listen, be kind, be respectful. And then more senior person needs to allow the junior person space to express themselves without imposing their own views and may ask a third person into the room, act as a buffer to allow for better flow of discussion. Yes, actually lots of the suggestions, we can take it back, uh, you know, to make it work for our team, to make it even with our family, sometimes, you know, parents and the kids, and especially if you come from a culture with a strong hierarchy, you know, seniority, power, and that could be the case. We could be in the shoes, actually, you know, of the junior staff, uh, given no room to speak, right? And listen, try to grasp as much as possible uh, the interlocutor background and the culture and adjust the way we interact. Thank you. And actually, uh, in the chat side, we have Russia. Thank you, Russia, uh, who said when we interact with the different cultures, we need to adjust our style, which is just like, you know, what is expressed here. Listening more to the other. Be open to listening. Either ask if you understood correctly or confirm what you understand by resuming. Dominant person should listen more and be patient. Yes, absolutely. Especially, you know, the junior staff is in a more kind of, you know, vulnerable situation status. And we need to be, be more aware of that and be encouraging. Agree on practical steps to follow next time. This is a great idea. Actually, you know, when we talk about value, respect, fairness, and belonging, all of us don't have a problem with. Be kind. However, you know, when it comes to behavior, what being kind is to me could not be being kind to somebody else, given we stand on the different side or different comfort zone of those uh, cultural dimensions. Sometimes uh, it can help if a third person is brought into. So this could be some idea. Uh, maybe, you know, I would suggest, recommend, to start with, just work it out, you know, between the two. Uh, if we really cannot control the situation, the whole situation is elevated or, uh, you know, it doesn't work. And then we can kind of, you know, have the help of a mediator. But a mediator is always one of, actually, you know, the alternatives we can turn to if we cannot work things out. Have the TTL say, please let him finish. So we are telling the TTL, right? Try to understand where the other person comes from, their communication styles of the person, and understanding the communication gap. Excellent. So going back the, to the communication style map, our junior staff obviously stays more in the indirect side of communication, while you know the TTL is more at the direct side. By the way, where do you think the bank, including our bank clients and our business stakeholders joining us today? So you might have uh, some kind of you know, feeling already, what would be the bank dominant culture in communication? Do we tend to be more direct? Do we tend to sugarcoat? Or do we tend not to listen? So uh, share with us so that we can improve how we work with our clients and our business uh, partners. Uh, given all your suggestions, actually, I think that feeds well into what we are going to look at next. What do we see here? The Blink model. And this Blink model is different from a Blink model you might have heard, you know, thinking without a 
uh, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking by uh, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell. It's a different, completely different model. Don't confuse it here. Although they are related, connected somewhere. But this is a model developed internally uh, at uh, the World Bank Group and uh, Blink to help us to communicate more effectively to help us build actually a more open communication kind of platform. So what does Blink mean? It is B-L-I-N-K. Let's take a look. So becoming aware is step number one, as many of you have suggested already, becoming aware of the different styles, different ways of doing things, so that you know what is your comfort level could be a stress point for the others. Let's see. So own style and those of your colleagues, team, clients, and business stakeholder, business partners, and also our unconscious biases. And very often, the unwritten rules, how we work with each other, especially when it comes to the behavioral level. When we talk about the core values, you know, most culture organizations and the countries, there are the core values. And very often, we share lots of core values with each other. But when it comes to the behavioral side, when we elevate it to our day-to-day -day life and our business relationship, so the unconscious biases comes to play a role, just like the relationship between Sato and Nixon, and also our TTL and also our junior staff. The common challenges we did say, you know, talk about BMW, Beijing, moaning, whining, and also NBC is actually nagging, Beijing, complaining, which can be actually very negative uh, for an organization, for a team, or for the negotiation table. So how do we really turn the cultural differences, the gaps into synergies, the gaps into bridges, our differences into synergies? And, you know, when that happens, you know, we talk behind people, we blame, we point fingers, and we just pull away from each other, us versus them. So which really kind of leads to kind of non-functioning working environment, no trust. So uh, let's just do as uh, the little baby here is doing. Look at ourselves in the mirror. When we point our fingers at others, point our fingers at ourselves first so that we have a better self-awareness before we jump to a wrong conclusion. Okay, listen. So which is one of the, one of the most repeated, actually, tips from our uh, from the part we shared just now. Yes, listen, listen, listen. And the picture, I would like you to take a look. We'll come back to that picture. It's a Chinese character. By the way, I do come from China, but it's not because I come from China. I'm sharing this. It will help you in a way. It has helped lots of bank staff, actually, with this pictographic. We'll come back to look at it. So what do we listen? We listen actually twice as much as we speak, as was shared by actually, you know, in one of our sayings. Hear out instead of figuring out. How often when you talk with somebody, you know, once you you have just started speaking, somebody will say, oh, yes, and this, oh, I know what you mean. So that kind of pushes us back, right? So also listen between lines, even listen to your inner voices. Very often we say, yes, Yes, but deep down, actually, in your heart, you are saying no. So how do we actually elevate that, bring that onto the table, and share it in a non-offensive way with our colleagues so that we really build a trust, safe environment to talk with each other? Also, watch, observe, nonverbal language. As we shared, the nonverbal language, according to studies, is 50, the, the body language actually is 55% of our communication. Tones, again, 37. And the word is only 
which actually raises questions about uh, our communication model today. We do actually kind of a lot on our emails, texting each other, blogging, and all that. So where is that human touch? We might need to actually you know, build the communication, make our communication more effective. How can we actually make up for the lack of the human touch to improve, enhance our communication? All those can be questions for us to actually, you know, to think more about. And also be vulnerable to listen, bring down ourselves, kind of, you know, as our DDL, right? So that we sit at the same table, sitting in the same chairs, looking at things from the same perspectives. Okay, so what is team, by the way? Practice to yourself. Unfortunately, this is not face-to-face. -face. I would love to hear you say it. But say it to yourself, team. And uh, actually, you know, when I walk around at the bank sometimes, uh, you know, I heard team. I know it's one of my partic participants. They don't remember my name, Rehua. They do remember team, though. All right, team, actually, year part. Those are made up of different kind of, you know, components here. The year part, of course, you do listen with your ears. And be the king means be in full control of your communication, where you want to go, what do you want to achieve, at the same time, not really impose on the others. Ten eyes, that means fully, fully present, not only listening, to the tones, to the words, but also watch their body language. So when Sato gave a kind of, you know, uh, heaven word in that uh, case study, kind of, you know, brow movement, if Nixon had uh, caught that, or if Nixon had been aware of that means a no indirect, and then that wouldn't have been that episode, right? And one heart, a full heart, instead of being mindful while I'm talking with somebody and my mind is full on my other agendas. All this can be damaging to our communication. So team, team, practice to yourself before I move on to the next slide. And actually, if you walk around at the bank also, uh, quite some uh, participants have printed this and posted on their door to remind people and themselves to listen more. Okay, so inquire. Inquire is to ask questions before we jump to conclusion, jump to judgment, as you have said. Really kind of clarify the understanding. Get back to Sato to check what he meant. Check, get back to our, you know, junior staff how we can help better. So in this little picture here, we have APE. If you look at the acronym APE, Assumption, Perception, and Expectation, APE can come into play a dirty trick when there is actually a gap of our communication, of our understanding, as you know, both examples I've shown. OK, what does the, and mean and means naming differences, cultural differences. If you are more direct, if I'm less direct, if I'm an apple, if you are orange, let's just be aware and be comfortable to share our differences in our communication so that we know what could be our potential challenges and work out a way, as you have said, some of you said, you know, list the rules how we communicate with each other. Absolutely. So that's what we need to do so that we can really create a safe environment so that we don't have to second doubt before I speak to share, to connect, so that we can build the trust. Keep communication, keep communication. When we look at this, whether we are junior staff or senior staff, if we do have a power, if there is a power kind of rank, ranking difference, or we do come with a different communication style as long as we actually continue to communicate. And very often, you know, we pull away from each other, communication breaks down, relationship breaks down. It happens with ourselves in our family. It happens between spouses 
okay, fine. I'm not going to talk with you anymore. If that happens, that's the end of our relationship. And in our international, diverse kind of, you know, culturally such rich but complicated at the same time environment, we cannot afford not to keep communicating. We have to continue to seek mutual understanding, engaging with each other, engaging heart to heart conversation. And deep breaths, and also promise to come back to the communication, asking open questions. And also, even if at a critical moment, at some kind of, you know, highly sensitive situation, just say, okay, let me take a minute, let me get back, let's get back, so that we don't burn the bridge. Even if it's somebody you, you don't feel you can really kind of synchronize with, you can, you know, you have some kind of a feeling of being pushed away, don't let it go down. Okay, now we have covered blink. What are they? When we say blink, B, becoming aware, L, listening, inquire, naming the differences, and keep communicating with each other. And this should take us to our action. Given all we have covered, I'm sure you know there are questions here and there, comments here and there. Uh, I really wish one day you could come to join my face-to-face -face session, even our, uh, our uh, friends and our clients, uh, when you have a chance, we'll see, uh, so that you know we can follow up more, we can catch up more. So after all this discussion, how would you apply the communication style map Remember the communication style map, the seven dimensions, and also the blink model to change your behaviors. Remember we said, what are your typical stress points in communication? What could be some of your behaviors that can turn your colleagues, your business partners away? So it could be others' cultural stress points. Some of us might not have any behaviors, right? That make others anxious. This could be a joke. Every one of us, when we have our own preferred behavior, it certainly could be somebody else's hot button behavior. So be more mindful here, aware. All right, yes. Let's use the poll and please type in, how can you use the communication style map to raise your awareness, understanding, and the blink model to help us navigate communication challenges. Hope all of us are still with us. We do have about 13 minutes to go. Great, we are getting more comments in. So, your action plan.
eight. We'll give it uh, two more seconds. We say three, two, one. Shall we close it so that we can share with each other what we have here? Okay, so I drag this up. Okay, great. So um, I believe many of us are still writing, but uh, so at least we can share some that have come in already. Naming differences in styles is one of the action, actually, one of our participants said. Definitely be more aware of my own behavior and how it might be in indirect conflict with another person. Position on the style map. Excellent. Vice versa. I learned that we should be aware of the environment, the cultural differences, and the person we are speaking with, listening, is not just by our ears, but we should check also their body language. And uh, one is key to me, right? Inquire uh, many, oh, sorry, let me, okay, here. Yeah. Many just speak, but do not ask questions. Yes, it happens. We keep talking, talking, talking without checking even, you know, where our audience is where we are right where the others are and uh, the conversation goes on one direction but so which is not productive we do want a two-way communication two-way conversation absolutely inquire when i think someone is attacking rather than answering back great hold our horses hold our emotions right rather than attacking back even in a very bad situation kind of, you know, inquire, check about the situation. It could be that person is under a very challenging personal situation when it happens. It can be used every day during work with our personal lives engaging. Thank you very much. Really try to apply it even in our personal life. Even when we communicate with somebody where we feel safe, very often we just let ourselves completely who we are out and uh, not paying too much attention to the feelings of the others. Try to apply it in the current workstation and the team composed of the. Uh, I would use the communication style map for self-reflection. That is part of the key actually, you know, do some self-reflection after our workshop even, you know, spend a few minutes, go over the slides. By the way, so, uh, one participant asked if you are going to have the class materials Yes, you are going to have the slide. You are going to have the whole actually video which has been recorded today of me. And also, I'm sure you know all the pod comments and the chat questions, right? We get all of them. So Javier can send you more uh, on, you know, how do you get there to access what we have done today. Really hope this has only got us interested because one hour is very, 90 minutes is very limited. I know it's already very, very long for a webinar. However, you know, the real workshops can take a whole day and uh, the most condensed form we offer is four hours still. So I do hope there will be time you can spend um, kind of, you know, reflecting more, going over the slides. If any questions, we do have a few minutes for our, uh, you know, if any questions now, and uh, even if after, please, uh, you have my email. I promise I'll send you my email to start out our conversation first so that I can send you any uh, kind of, you know, uh, questions or concerns, um, you know, just how I view it, how we can help and work with each other. Great. Any questions? And uh, plus, after our questions and answers, we're going to use the chat. 
type in chat if you have any questions and uh, answers and suggestions. We do have a feedback form on the right side where you can click, uh, you know, before you leave us today. All right. So I do have a question. How would you use the communication? Oh, that was from last time. Yes. So any questions in chat? I do see Jackson and Allison typing. Our only kind of value of interaction right now is the little chat window. Please make use of it. Yeah, I do see more colleagues typing in. Yeah, I'm kind of, you know, bringing up the chat so that all of us can see it as well. Sharing articles. Jackson said, I read an article that explains why we shout when we are angry. The distance between the hearts of communication parties, interesting, has increased. When the distance increases, we shout, right? We believe we don't hear each other. Yeah. Also, thank you. And any other questions here? If no questions, I'm sure you know it might take some time for us to uh, come up with questions. I want to thank you all. Thanks very, very much for your active participation, the interactions. I love actually, you know, all your comments. And before you go, please uh, do your feedback and let us know how it goes and how much we can do better for you in the future. And uh, I do have actually, yes, a question from Allison. Thank you, Allison. Wonder if there is a gender dimension. Oh, that was from before, I see. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.